Knife's witness statements. Yeah. And my understanding is that the respondent is neutral. Uh, we support it. I, I emphasize as a reporting media organization rather than any other capacity. Um, of course, the court will be dealing with this application in due course and its judgment. I have referred to it. I will be referring to a few pages of the evidence this morning. Um, but of course, it's a matter for the court, which is why we referred the request um, to the court. Um, we, we broadly support the way it's put in the, um, in the application by the PA. Right. And is there any issue with the order made by um, Lord Justice Warby about privacy? Um, Page 111 in the core bundle, is it? Well, I, I suspect that the proviso which your Lordship added kindly at the beginning of the hearing probably deals with it because it becomes part of the appeal. Right. Um, but so, Mr. Rushbrook, you're neutral, are you? My lord, uh, we are. I mean, the, the, um, the statement of Mr. Nauf obviously stands in a different position from that of our client. She can con consent to giving a copy to the press if they ask for it, but she can't obviously speak for Mr. Nauf. We don't know what his position is, but in the absence of any uh, objection from him, um, we do take a neutral stance, uh, subject only to the point, obviously, that it's... Um, hasn't yet been ruled on by the court as to whether the, the evidence goes in at all. No, but it is um, probably quite likely to have the details of it anyway adumbrated in open court. Yes. Um, indeed, they were yesterday. They, they, were they were, I think, referred to. And yes. I've heard what the learned friend says, and I, I shall equally be referring to our statement as well. So I think that um, that really is probably the end of it. Thank you. Very well. Yes, uh, they may have the um, they may have the statement from Mr. Now. Um, thank you very much, Lord. Um, just one other housekeeping matter. We supplied the note which your lordship requested. Yes, thank you. Um, well, there are two refinements to it. Um, one just a matter of legal chronology, and the other a minor correction. The, s the second heading. Could I please ask the court? It should read stage one and stage two because. Paragraphs three and four go both to the first question, and if the first question were satisfied, to the second as well. Sorry, the, which heading? The second heading, Lord, says stage one at the moment, existence of reasonable expectation of yeah. privacy. It's also relevant to stage two if the existence were established. Yeah. Now, there's a very subtle point, but I, I perhaps just to avoid any confusion, I should explain it. Campbell at 141 refers to Ray S mm -hmm. at paragraph 141. It is actually a reference to Ray S in the Court of Appeal because Ray S in the House of Lords had not yet come out. It was followed by Ray S in the House of Lords, and the critical paragraph is the authorities, tab 19, bundle 1, paragraph 17 at page 407, and Lord Stain's presentation um, of the proportionality test is now recognized as, as generally governing the situation. It's just that it's a little involved, and I thought it right just to explain it in case your Lordship's thought that that was a reference to Reyes in the, in the House of Lords. Um, Lord, two questions from yesterday which I should answer. One from a Lord the Master of the Rolls about the ratio in ZXC. Can I very briefly deal with that in Authorities Bundle 2 at tab 36? Um, and I pointed out to your Lordship, your Ladyship will recall, at paragraph 46, the reference to JR 38 and the implication, perhaps, of a burden in that last sentence. But what is important, perhaps more important for the purposes of this case, is the use of the words necessary and proportionate. And that's worth just looking at paragraph 116 of, on page 36.
page 997 of the bundle. Finally, in considering the respective justifications for interference of the claimant's article rate rights and Bloomberg's article 10 rights, the judge concluded that interference with the latter was necessary and proportionate to secure the legitimate aim of protecting the claimant's reasonable expectation of privacy. Now, there's nothing objectionable about that. That is a conclusion after the proper balancing exercise looking at the two competing rights. The problem in this case is the words of necessary and proportionate are applied by the judge to the publication as a criterion for what is permissible and what is not. That is a different use of the words necessary and proportionate. So we would respectfully say that the use of the words necessary and proportionate of 116 is, is wholly acceptable, um, but it doesn't, um, and it doesn't trespass on the way the judge approached those two terms in this particular case, if that's um, understandable. Um, now, the second question was from the leadership um, about whether or not the words defamatory appeared um, in the defence. They do not. But can I just give some references? Perhaps we don't need to turn them up, but just for the note. Pausing there, we took on board um, my Lord's observation about a transcript. We are getting a transcript, and you will get it, I think, on Friday of day one, and we will do a continuing transcript from now on. Um, and I'm sorry it wasn't available um, sooner, but um, we take the plea on board. Um, just to give you the references, 13.8.6 of the re-amended defence at page 329, 1513 and 1516 at page 345, and there's a reference there to the reply to people being necessary for Mr. Markle's reputation and it being a weighty right for him to tell his version, and 17.8.2 at page 355, which relates to the letter. Now, it's right to say that those pleadings don't refer in terms to the allegation against Mr. Markle in relation to him saying he'd been cut off by the claimant as a lie, but his witness statement before the court at supplemental bundle, tab 7, page 62, at paragraph 7, clearly states his understanding that he was being accused of lying. And we submit on any view that was a wholly reasonable interpretation of the People article for the reasons I gave yesterday. Well, can I just very quickly, sorry, take a pun. And look, can I very quickly just finish off what I was saying about the text yesterday? I dealt um, with the People article. It's referred to in paragraph 9 of our note. Um, this is the question of the texts. Um, and all I want to point out is that this allegation features in the letter as well as in the People article. And one can see that from the judge's summary of the letter at paragraph 45 of his judgment. And there are quite a number of paragraphs which are relevant, and the small words are important. Paragraph 1, the last time we spoke was seven days before our wedding, when Harry and I called you. Just pausing there, that's also relevant to the cut-off allegation. And then in 2, from my phone alone, I called you over 20 times and you ignored my calls, opting instead to solely speak to the tabloids. If you please just note that word, solely. Leaving me in the days before our wedding, worried, confused, shocked, and then these important words, absolutely blindsided. In other words, I didn't have a clue from you as to what was going on. And then um, in four, 
you've told the press you called me to say you weren't coming to the wedding. That didn't happen because you never called. But of course, as we've seen, he texted very clearly to say he couldn't come and he was sad he couldn't come. So that's another paragraph. And then seven. So the week of the wedding, this has to be read in the context of the earlier paragraph, to hear about you having a heart attack through a tabloid was horrifying. Now, there's an element of truth in that because he did first tell TMZ, the American website. But of course, in the context of four, um, the implication is that he never told um, the claimant himself. I called you and texted you and desperately tried to find out what about the medical treatment you need and where you need. I begged you to accept help. We sent someone to your home, tried to have them drive you to the hospital to get the best care and protection for you, and instead of speaking to me to accept this or any help, you stopped answering your phone and chose to only speak to the tabloids. Uh, we say that it is a travesty of the history of communications between the claimant and Mr. Markle. Um, in the run-up to the wedding. Now, this controversy is also in the articles complained of. Um, you have, I hope, a more legible copy. Perhaps we don't need to turn it up, but can I just give you some references? In the first article... Sorry, what, what are we looking at? The actual articles complained of, just to show that this... Also yes, I'm afraid I've, I've left mine behind. Let Where do I find them? Yes, I have a list of them yesterday. Uh, so privacy for the fact that her letter accused her father of snubbing her and Prince Harry's offer of help when he pulled out attending their wedding following two heart attacks and there's another matter about money. But you'll see that privacy is being claimed for that. And then you'll see at K on the right hand side where there are a number of extracts from the letter, little K um, deals with that specifically and then in the second article if you kind of turn over to the next double page spread you'll see that privacy is being claimed for the way this accusation is put against Mr. Markle, 13 on the left hand side to the bottom, in her letter the Duchess accuses him of ignoring her increasingly desperate attempts to reach him. She writes from my phone call, I called you over 20 times and you ignored my calls, leaving me in the days before our wedding worried and confused, shocked and absolutely blindsided. Mr. Markle shakes his head, I don't know anything about 20 phone calls, there were no missed messages. Well, that's obviously a tribal issue. We can't um, resolve that at this stage. Then this, he shows me a text message dated May the 16th, which he insists proves conclusively that he told the couple he couldn't fly to the UK as planned. The text reads, surgery went OK. The doctor will not allow me to fly, so of course I'm sorry, but I can't come. Love you and wish the best of everything. And then it, it, the, there's more of that and more references to the text in the succeeding paragraphs. Now, what is bizarre about the claimant's position is that she has no objection to him giving his reply, but he's not allowed to show the way in which the accusation was put against him. And that um, 
again, is another issue which will have to be weighed in this complicated case um, at trial. Now, I've already touched on the second um, accusation, which was the suggestion that he'd made a patently false suggestion that she had shut him out. Um, I've already referred to the fact that she did not contact him again after the letter was sent, or indeed after the wedding, save for the letter. And that is confirmed in some further information from her, which is in Paul Bundle 2, tab 21, at pages 342 to 343. I'm sorry, no, that's a wrong reference. I think of one. It's tab 24, I should have said, at page 540. I apologize. 540. Request 47.1. Claimant has not co contacted um, her father. Is it admitted that? I'm sorry. The claimant has not contacted her father since 16th of May 2018, except by way of the letter. Answer 47.1. This is not correct. The claimant attempted contact with her father up until the day of her wedding. <coughs> so quite how he can be accused of falsely alleging that she cut him off um, is at the moment very unclear, um, uh, but certainly one would have thought a matter he's entitled to reply to. The photo opportunity case, um, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time um, on this. Um, the court will have the wording um, of Mr. Markle's reply um, on this, um, and it's um, it's in the letter. I can't immediately see see where, but his case is that I mean I can see the argument he might have been naive, but his case is. Um, that he was simply suggesting getting a photograph and then giving it to the media and that would assuage their interests and suggest that they were having a, a happy relationship. Yes. And it's in the article. Under an H in the second article... On the right-hand side, there are various captions dealing with his anguished reply. And the middle one, just above the red, the rather striking red of his letter to Doria, at letter H, you can hate me if you want, I can't force you, I made a big mistake. I'm human and I'm sorry, how much longer must I say it? I wish we could get together and take a photo for the whole world to see. If you don't like it, make it for one photo. And then underneath that, Mr. Markle insists his bid to reduce press intrusion was completely misinterpreted. Now, there is um, an important finding of the judge, which we criticise um, in our notes. And this relates um, to the finding, it's in paragraph 10 of our notes, that the effect on Mr. Markle's reputation and private life was modest. Uh, that also refers to the judgment of 125, 1, and 4. This paragraph is in the main context um, of the olive branch. And yesterday I made the submission. The bad behaviour attributed to him <coughs> makes his refusal of the olive branch look even worse. At 
1251 it said that the olive branch was not an attack on, on Mr. Markle. That we criticise at paragraph 10 of our notes. We say it's certainly part of the attack because there's no reference at all to his efforts to get hold of her, which are fully addressed in the article. And it says self-defense has little or nothing to do with this justification. Well, we suggest it's got everything to do with it. And then if you just look at subparagraph 4 of 125, please. The second sentence, the defendant clearly has a point when it says Mr. Markle's credibility with the public was an issue. Quite an understatement, we say. But the effect of the inaccuracy on Mr. Markle's reputation and private life was modest. Now, he'd heard no evidence, live evidence, from Mr. Markle. Mr. Markle's evidence in his witness statement was that he was shocked by what he read. And in the light of the history, as, uh, as I've attempted to explain it, it's not surprising. And in any event, the effect on Mr. Markle is surely a tribal issue. And of course, the effect of saying that it's modest is it tends to downgrade his Article 10 rights, which are an important part of the equation. Can I just ask you, um, going back a step, um, this is presaged on the... Um, part of your case which deals with responsibility for the people article and the extent to which the claimant was responsible for yes. it, which you deal with in 13.8.1 and 13.8.7 I think but the preceding number is going to need to be amended anyway it's on 326 of electronic bundling what did the judge say about that part of your case um, because really, I was because going the, to come to, as I understand yes. it, just to complete the point, as I understand it, the, this is all to do with the, the, the entitlement of Mr. Markle and in a derivative form the Mail on Sunday to either put the record straight or to um, uh, enable him to vindicate his reputation per Article 8 and or exercise his right to freedom of expression Article 10. But that's all presages it on the claimant's responsibility for what emerged in the people article. Lady, my understanding is that the, the defendant's case plainly was pleaded that the people article was with the claimant's blessing. And that is an issue in dispute, uh, which we say cannot be resolved until trial. But even if, even if it were only her friends, and this is why it's important to understand that some of these charges are in the letter itself. <coughs> the false narrative about the wedding is in the letter itself. And the friends then pass that narrative to the people. And our case is that the claimant was aware that this was going on. But even if she wasn't, on the day of publication of the People article, this is going into the detail, she has a FaceTime conversation with her friends about the article, and she does nothing to correct it. Uh, the, the, the but, facts but here are complex. Well, the, ju the, the, judge, the judge's position, the lady, th throughout this really is that unless the text came out, hmm. um, it's immaterial. Um, and if one looks at paragraph 81 and 82, and one of our complaints is that this is all analysed 
under the heading Public Domain. And, and you'll look at 82. The defendant has an elaborate factual case. Indeed, it is quite elaborate about how the people came to be published. Attributing this to conversations between the claimant and her friends and decisions about the public profile made by or on behalf of the claimant. The defendant, and then there's a bit I needn't trouble with, but none of this bears on the issue under discussion here, namely public domain. The short point is that disclosure of information about the existence of the letter and a description of the context is not at all the same thing as disclosure of the detailed content. Now, the problem, we have a number of problems with that, but the main problem is this. If the letter makes a serious allegation against Mr. Markle, and he's entitled to reply, and we are entitled to carry the reply, the fact that the text has not hitherto been in the public domain has very little to do with it. It's not a public domain issue. And our case simply is, and this is obviously very germane to the wedding allegation, that he's entitled to show that not only was it in People magazine, but it was also an allegation the claimant was making against him in the letter. That is also part of our case, of course, as to why we say there is, the claimant is behind the People magazine, but that the false narrative in the letter appears in the People magazine. And we will later see that even Mr. Knauf appears to be, have been given this narrative as well. Okay. That comes from the fresh evidence and was not before the judge. Now, well, can I, Milady, I move on to a really important issue because this is really very fundamental, and that is the inherent privacy of the letter and whether it was constructed for Mr. Markle's eyes only. It obviously goes both to both stage one, and if stage one is satisfied, to stage two, and it's dealt with in our notes at paragraphs three and four. Now, it is important, and only once am I going to do this, just to see how the case was put to the judge on behalf of the claimant at the hearing. And we can see this in the supplemental bundle at tab 16. And it's right... And this is the claimant's skeleton argument. And the privacy submissions start in detail on page 167 of the bundle, page 13 of the skeleton. And what the judge was told, first of all, there, can I just give you the paragraph numbers which are critical for this? 59, 60, 61, and 64. The act of writing a personal letter to a close family member, lover, or friend puts the writer in an unguarded and potentially vulnerable position because the words chosen and the way in which the writer chooses to express himself or herself are for the recipient and no one else. The letter is unique to the relationship with the recipient and reveals more about it than any other form of communication. And then there's a reference in 60 to the contents of a private letter saying far more about the writer than a mere description of the letter. And then 61, these features are all present in the case of the letter to a very high degree. It's a heartfelt plea from an anguished daughter to her father begging him to stop talking to the press. It's as good an example as one could find of a letter that any person of ordinary sensibilities would not want disclosed 
the third parties. And then at 64, in particular, the inference that the defendant seeks to invite, and the first part of this um, inference is, is not quite right and we've withdrawn it, <coughs> alternatively knowing that the same was very likely, is mere assertion and flies in the face of, A, the intrinsically private and sensitive nature of the letter's contents for all the reasons given above, the fact that the letter had not been previously published by the claimant or anyone else, and see the loss of control that was necessarily entailed. So the picture presented to the judge on behalf of the claimant, and uh, this plainly represented um, part of the strikeout application, was that this was an entirely private letter written for Mr. Markle's crafted for Mr. Markle's eyes only. Now, there are a large number of paragraphs which we say show that whatever the judge may have said about having regard to that sentence, he plainly um, took this on board in his substantive decision. First of all, when he formulates um, the dilemma before him at 35 and 36, he says, does the writer of a letter, this is quoting the learned friend's submission, that is self-evidently private and sensitive, have the right to decide when and how to what extent to publish, or does a newspaper? One of the problems with this formulation is that Mr. Markle is no part of it. Mr. Markle's critical to, this, to the whole structure of this case. Um, he's simply not included in the summary in 35. And then in 36, the judge says, this way of putting it reflects more closely than the application notice the well-established two-stage approach in domestic law. The different differences are, I think, more substantive than, um, sorry, more semantic than substantive. And then at 69.3, the judge says, there is no room for serious debate about some aspects of the Murray factors objectively assessed. And if you could just please look at the third factor in that list, which is about halfway through the paragraph, number three, she was doing this in a letter sent to him alone, privately, by means of a courier service. So any notion that this letter was constructed with an eye to public consumption, we say, is really um, out of the picture. And then at 72, in the middle of that paragraph, about seven, six, seven, six lines down, even if it could, that would beg the question of whether it followed that she had no privacy rights in relation to the details of an anguished private letter putting out her heart. And at 76.1, this was not a business letter or one advancing a complaint to a politician about their public conduct or functions. It was a communication between family members with a single addressee. Precautions were taken to ensure it was delivered only to him. It was, in short, a personal and private letter. And then at three, nor can it be said that Mr. Markle's undoubted right to tell his own life story is unqualified or that it defeats or overrides. And this slightly curious phrase, which slightly mirrors um, what our criticism elsewhere, the claimant's presumptive right uh, to keep the contents of the letter private. And then we get really very similar. At 78, 77, I should introduce this. This is where the judge does address the case on media strategy and that it was likely to be referred to in the public domain. 
Point A, which is the part of the case that remains about likelihood, the judge says this, point A is about the propensity or disposition of the addressee, Mr. Markle, to make unwanted disclosure and the extent to which this was or should have been known to the claimant. The pleaded case is denied and it's certainly debatable, not least because it appears to be contradicted by Mr. Markle's own position prior to the People article. Mr. Markle has no idea how the letter was prepared. Uh, how can his state of appreciation of this issue have anything to do with it? What matters is what the claimant was doing, um, or had in mind, I should say, when she prepared the letter. Then beyond, but even assuming the facts to be pleaded, they are not capable of defeating the claimant's case, that objectively speaking, she had a right to expect her father to keep the contents of the letter private. Uh, Lord, there is a wealth of detail and fresh evidence about this, and I'm going to take only three pages of it by way of Sorry, example. Mr. Sorry. It's a summary of the judge's position um, in 78. A person's rights against another are not defeated by the prospect that those rights may be ignored or violated. Yes. That encapsulates the judge's view. Yes, I think that's... And, and you say that's wrong? Well, the, the true position, and this is, this is why this is so obviously a triable issue, the true position, as we now know it, is much more nuanced. It's not a question of risk-taking, which is central to this, as we now know it. The case, the pleaded case, which was very unparticularized, that she had a media strategy, plainly didn't impress the judge. But the position we now have is a different position and a very nuanced position that the letter was written and crafted with readership by the public in mind. And indeed, we'll see when we come to some examples, she was happy for the public to read it if Mr. Markle were to leak it. Now, can I also, just before I go to the document, just remind the court what the pleaded case from the claimant was about this. The core bundle 2 at tab 26 at 608 and this was in the original defence, the first bit. Could you just look at the third line? And this is a positive case the claimant did not suspect, let alone expect, and we accept she didn't expect it, but she certainly suspected it when we come to look at the documents. The claimant did not suspect that he would do so, not least because of its contents and how they reflected upon him. The contention that she knew that it was possible or even likely that he was bound to do so if the existence and or contents of the letter were referred to in the public domain is ludicrous. If I ask the court please to go to the application bundle, and I'm going to be very selective because time is quite short. Bundle tab five, please. Page thirty one. This is an exchange about the draft letter to Mr. Knauf, um, and this um, is a is an email or a text? It's a text. Um, and just just below halfway, obviously, everything I have drafted is with the understanding that it could be leaked. So I have been meticulous in my word choice. 
but please do let me know if anything stands out for you as a liability, in other words, presumably as potentially um, harmful to her reputation. And then at 35, there is a postscript to this text with a couple of asterisks headed Jason. Second line, given I've only ever called him daddy, it may make sense to open as such, despite him being less than paternal. And in the unfortunate event that it leaked, it would pull at the heartstrings. I also don't know if I need why you're doing this, but I'm on the fence about it. The rest is in the spirit of facts, without seeming orchestrated or litigious. Simply an appeal for peace and a reminder of what's actually happened. And the last one... Sorry, I, I, I can't find that. But I beg your pardon, there's a postscript for the couple which, of... Which page? Page, I do beg your pardon, 35 oh. of the bundle. Yeah, thank you. In the postscript. Yeah. And lastly, 39. Right at the bottom... Honestly, Jason, I feel fantastic, cathartic and real and honest and factual. And if he leaks it, then that's on his conscience, obviously not conscious, but at least the world will know the truth. Words I could never voice publicly. And just over the page while we're at it, 40, trust me, toiled over every detail. And we see the rest of this on page 41, which could be manipulated. So we read on which one? To his response. And then his response at 41 left nothing to chance. That's the only way through this. Do you want to read? No. Now, there was at least an indication before the judge, we say, um, that further material um, might become available and that was in the first Adelshaw letter and I just give your lordship a reference to that it's supplemental bundle tab 12 I want to first of all deal with what the judge <coughs> says, says about it you're going to give us a page um, yes, sorry, Lord, yes, 128 is the first page of that tab, tab, 128 of the bundle, but it's 129 that matters. <coughs> and this is a letter which is suggesting that there may be, doc there will be documents and evidence that the Palace 4 could give at the trial. Um, for my purposes, the first bullet point doesn't matter, that's a copyright question. The second one is whether or not the claimant anticipated that the letter might come into the public domain. So that was before the judge. And we say at least an amber light that there might be important evidence for the trial. Because if it was insignificant, why, why would experienced solicitors like Adam Shaw raise it? And then lastly, this is a relevant to a different point, but that's why here I may as well deal with it. Whether or not the claimant directly or indirectly provided private information, brackets generally, we don't matter too much about the generally, and in relation to the letter specifically to the authors of Finding Freedom. Now, even now, Mr. Knauf does not deal with anything provided to the authors about the letter. So even now, there is plainly further evidence yet to come about what was said about the letter to the authors of the book. Now, the judge deals with the Adelshaw letter at 163, <coughs> where he sets a sets it out. <coughs> A 
and um, I, I'm not going to, the time is short, my, my point is a, is a simple one. Um, he then gives a conclusion at 164 of his judgment, and that's rather focused on, on the copyright case. Um, and at, he then really deals with it um, on the copyright aspect. <coughs> and at 166, he effectively um, dismisses all this material as Macorberite at 165. He says the defendant's factual and legal case on this issue. This is again the copyright issue, seem to me to occupy the shadowland between improbability and unreality. But actually, the Adelshaw letter is important as indicating the prospective availability of evidence on the privacy issues. Is that how he's put before the judge? Because if one looks at the beginning of 163, it appears that this is focused very much on copyright. Maybe can I give you a reference? Mr. White, who appeared below, certainly put considerable emphasis on the Adelshaw letter as suggesting the availability of further evidence. And we'll give you, I'll give you an ownership of reference, if I may, in a minute. But there's probably something in the skeleton argument about it, but I'll... Now, can I come to another topic which we say was a, a, a triable issue? And that is the communications with the authors about the letter, which I've just touched on. Now, at 84 of his judgment, the judge accepts that there is a triable issue because of what Mr. Verity says as to whether or not a copy of the letter was shown um, to the authors, and that's at paragraph 84 of the judgment. <coughs> and he's quite critical of the um, defendant's case on this, but he says, I would accept that there is a trial of factual issues here. But then again, he, he treats this as a public domain issue. For the purposes of the public domain issue, however, it's one that is of no consequence. What he doesn't do is appreciate that this is all to do... Obviously, we were not suggesting that the letter was already in the public domain at the time the mail articles were published. The mail articles were indeed the first media entity to, to carry the text of the letter. But the defendant's case was that this reflected deployment of the letter in a way that was relevant um, under the principle in AAA. So not public domain, but an, a sort of willingness to feed it into the public bloodstream. Not the text. And as we've seen, um, again, from the Adelshaw letter, there was an indication that further evidence would come available about the dealings with the book. Now, when this allegation was introduced by amendment, it was, as the court may remember, very strongly opposed um, by the claimants. And there was a witness statement put forward at the application to amend. And it starts at supplemental bundle tab 10. It starts at page 77. And at paragraph 78, The last sentence says this, in addition, the claimant and her husband have publicly stated that they were not interviewed for, and we accept that's correct, 
but also this, and did not contribute to the book. Now this was opposed root and branch on the basis this case was demonstrably and clearly false. It's a slightly odd way of putting it, because actually what matters is whether they did, not what they publicly said, but the gist of it, um, of the case being advanced, um, is pretty clear. And also, somewhat bafflingly, there was a witness statement from Mr. Scobie, who is one of the co-authors of the book. And the first sentence of paragraph six of his witness statement, same bundle, supplemental bundle, tab nine, page 71. This is rather curious that they both should be in error on this point. First sentence of paragraph six, any suggestion that the Duke and Duchess collaborated on the book is false. Now, Lord, again, I'm going, going to be very selective, if I may, because of time, but there is a lot of evidence uh, in the application of fresh evidence about the extent um, of the cooperation with the book. And I'm going to have to be, um, again, very selective. Could we please start with tab 6B? And could you please go, first of all, to page 74.9? And this is a text to Mr. Knauvi. This is an email, so I will give you this one. Uh, an email. You know how personally frustrated this is a particular point, the stylus narrative is this. And then this. And please note the words used here. But given we are being asked to cooperate, the identical word, to cooperate with this evidently authoritative biography. I need to share, I will not be comfortable doing so if this person, this is an authority, is tweeting us below. Can we set up a chat? I feel he needs to be back briefed as soon as possible if there's any conversation about, and then this is the other word, collaborate, about working with them, which is a total synonym for collaborate, moving forward. And the history then um, moves on, and we please go back to tab um, and just looking quickly at page 43, morning sir, these are all reverse order I'm afraid, so one has to start at the bottom. Morning sir, and this is to Prince Harry, Please see attached topic areas that Omid and Carolyn, us the co-authors, want to discuss. Please can you decide if you'd like to share these with the Duchess? It's my view that it's not a good idea of the Duchess to open this up to her friends, but I'm happy to facilitate it either way. I think both have a natural instinct to want to balance the record in defence of the Duchess. Being able to say hand on heart that we did not facilitate access will be important. And that's all about the friends. Let me know what you think. I will see them this week to help them with factual accuracy and context. And then Prince Harry replies, I think definitely share this, and this with the Duchess and make the suggestion to her that you have here. She will be 100% supported, and I totally agree that we have to be able to say we didn't have anything to do with it. Equally, you have the right context and background for them and help to get some truths out there. The truth is very much needed and would be appreciated, especially around the Markle wedding stuff, but at the same time we can't put them directly in touch with her friends. And then um, there is a communication from the claimant with um, a number of headings which she obviously wants to be discussed at the meeting between Mr. Knauf and the authors. 
This runs from page 44 to 46. And she asked, please let me know if you need me to fill in any other blanks. That's in about the fourth line. Mr. Knauss' witness statement says he has multiple conversations with her about this book at the time. Conversations are not only um, texts and emails. And I think it's fair to make the point just below the punch hole. Sorry, in the Lord's copy, it's a, it's, you'll see a number of dashes. Then there's a dash which says upon Megan dating Harry. But you'll see that the claimant in rebuttal is not shy of sharing private information with the authors. I just ask you, I'm not going to read this out for obvious reasons, but just look at the sentence after the word Samantha. There's then a sentence which is, one would have thought, plainly private personal information um, being given to the authors of the book. And broadly, no doubt, she would say for some corrective function. But there is an element of hypocrisy here with great respect. And then there is also, over the page on page 45, the light, the light print is the outline and the, the heavy print are you know, the suggestions coming from the claimant. And again, the, the, one, the fairly long bit of text at the bottom is about um, the Tiara incident. And there had been some publicity about that. But again, it would look to be a fairly private meeting with Her Majesty, the Queen, uh, and she gives details of it. And again, she would no doubt say, I'm entitled to do that, to correct the record. But uh, I'm very keen to try and keep, um, to give my colleague enough time to do, deal with the copyright. And can I therefore just say this about the People magazine? Um, I think I'm right in saying it's common ground that a friend called Friend A spoke to the People magazine. It's disputed as to whether or not the claimant asked or encouraged her to do so. <coughs> or gave her general encouragement, and she chose the People magazine. These are all triable issues, we say. It's also quite clear from further information, I don't think I need to take you to it, that the claimant had a FaceTime conversation on the day of publication of the People article with friend A and one other friend, C, A, B, and C, apparently. Now, one way, she, what she could have done if she'd wanted to try at least to preserve the privacy of the letter is to have contacted the People magazine and said, look, this narrative is unfair and wrong about my father. Please just put it right. But she didn't do that. And that's no doubt why, why Mr. Markle then came to the mail. And I may say, just so we're on the question of consent, Mr. Markle was not contacted by the people beforehand. And I lastly just make one reference quickly to the handwriting article. Um, this was only in the mail online. It's obviously not part of Mr. Markle's reply. But we say this, once the text of the letter is properly in the public domain on public interest grounds, be they correction, right of reply, or general public interest. It's open for commentary. It may not be a very enlightening commentary. Um, and actually, as it happens, her calligraphy is praised in the People article. And it was well known that she, uh, about her handwriting. It's not a very enlightening part of the articles, I'm first to accept. And lastly, and I'm almost, almost on time, I'm glad to say, lastly, can I just um, give my ladyship the reference to whether it was put to the judge about the Adelshaw letter, 
It's in the supplemental bundle. <coughs> it was a confidential annex to the defendant's skeleton argument at page 225, tab 18. The issues, it says this in paragraph 2, the issues identified in the Adelshaw letter upon which the Palace Hall are in a position to shed light are central factual issues in the litigation, all of which are strongly contested. Put at its lowest, there will be further evidence available at trial relating to central issues in the litigation from independent witnesses with direct <coughs> contemporaneous knowledge of the relevant facts which is not presently available. And it wasn't limited to copyright. <coughs> now, Lord, any other any other issues I can assist you on? Anything else? Yeah? Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Jack. Uh, Mr. Speck. Sorry. Uh, all my lords and my lady, just give me a minute to rearrange. Uh, <laughs> As I think uh, you know, I have grounds eight and nine to address. They are the interference with free speech and the fair dealing defences, respectively. And what I'm going to do is move directly to ground eight, the balance with free speech, taking that defence first, as I did in front of the judge. Now, my learned friend has spent some considerable time in his analysis on the privacy side of the case including the balance between the Article 8 and Article 10 rights in this case. And he's specifically sought to explain to my lords and my lady why Mr Markle had a legitimate free speech right to seek to have put into the public domain the extracts from the letter that he did. <coughs> of course, the case is broader than that. The conflict with free speech is more than just the balance with the right of Mr Markle, because it includes the free speech rights of my client and their readers. But I can perhaps identify or illustrate a key point on the copyright side of the case by focusing on Mr Markle. And, and the central point that I want my lords and my lady to have in mind is this. If my learned friend persuades you that Mr Markle had a free speech right to place those extracts into the public domain, if the content and tone of the letter is something it was legitimate for him to wish to convey to the public, is the claimant's property right, her, co her copyright, something that can be deployed to prevent him from doing so? Put another way, is the claimant's right to complain of an infringement of this specific copyright, copyright a weightier right than Mr Markle's right to say, look, this is actually what the letter I received from her daughter said. This is the actual communication I received. <coughs> that, in my submission, is a key issue that my lords and my lady should keep uh, your eye on at all times. <coughs> and it's common ground this question requires a weighing of fundamental rights. Free speech rights and the incursion into the property right, namely the copyright, and it requires that because they're in conflict. We say the law requires an intense focus to be made between those competing rights, with neither starting with the upper hand. And if my clients are right, and the claimant may not enforce <laughs> this copyright, and Mr Markle, and indeed my clients and its readers' free speech rights are the weightier rights, My client is wrong. The claimant has a property right that can prevent Mr. Markle from taking the course I just mentioned, saying, look, this is actually the letter I received. He's prevented from doing that. He can assert the letter was not a loving one. There was no attempt at reconciliation and so forth. But he can't actually put the text into the public domain for the people to see. The effect of that is, in substance, that he cannot show its actual tone and content or do anything more persuasive than simply make assertions of the kind I've indicated. 
And it's perhaps worth noting that if the claimant had taken the same trouble to consider what she wanted to say, but had expressed herself in the same terms to him orally, subject to the privacy claim, of course, there could be no complaint to Mr. Markle giving a precise account of what was said and disclosing the tone and content of the communication. Now, of course, the issue before the judge and before my lords and my ladies is not whether my client or the claimant is right, but whether my client has no reasonable prospect of succeeding if the matter went to trial. Now, I, of course, do not intend to repeat any of my friend's submissions, which in covering the two sides of the balance on the privacy part of the case, privacy and free speech, is obviously covering the detail of one side of the balance on my side of the case. And if he persuades you that there's an error in the judge's approach to free speech rights on his part of the case, that will be good for my part of the case too. So what I will be addressing is the weight of the claimant's countervailing right and the nature of the balancing exercise itself. And I obviously adopt everything my learned friend has said in relation to the approach to the free speech right itself. Now, what I say about this, weighing the importance of a right to object to a copyright infringement, obviously involves assessing both what the particular right protects <coughs> and the extent to which it's been encroached upon. But in another way, one we needs to know about one, the nature, importance, and extent of the subject matter protected, and two, the degree to which that has been taken. One could it infringe a slight right completely, taking the whole thing, but that may be a less weighty matter in the kind of balance we're considering than infringing a much more substantial and important right only partially, perhaps even slightly. And so there are two parts of this, identifying what the protected subject matter is, which of course you have to have a handle on before one then goes on to look to see what degree has it been taken. Now with that introduction, can I give you a brief overview of what our case is on copyright? At this stage, very brief. The infringement in this case is taking of extracts, not all, but nearly half of the text of a copyright work, which is itself a very modest work in terms of what the law of copyright protects, as I shall explain. Notably, the letters of a factual nature, so the protection is limited to the intellectual creativity in the selection of the particular form of language. There is no intellectual creativity and therefore no protection extending to the actual contents that are factual, described by the claimant herself, I think, in a document that you were just taken to as what actually transpired. And of course, many literary works have a much deeper and broader protection because their detailed contents themselves are also part of the intellectual creativity of the author. But where one has a short factual piece of writing, a conflict with free speech is particularly likely, and that is made doubly so, where an issue on which the person or persons seeking to exercise free speech rights to be able to disclose the tone and content, which is the argument here. Now, the balance, as I've already said, of fundamental rights in a copyright case is plainly between the incursion into that property right of the author, that property right being the interest giving her the right to control the publication of her particular choice of language against the free speech interests of Thomas Markle to disclose the tone and content of the communication from his daughter, and of course, in addition, the free speech rights of my clients and its readers. 
Now, we, we say the balancing exercise requires an intense focus and is nuanced. And it's not one that's suitably approached, approached summarily and not in the very granular way the judge did. Nor, from the starting point, that one right will likely trump the other. Moreover, it is not right to approach the balance from the view that reproducing more of the text will or must be more objectionable than reproducing less. It may well be that reproducing more, not less, is fairer. Not just because the nature of the free speech right, for example, here, where the point is to communicate the tone and content, may make trying to do so with less text difficult or impossible. But I go further than that. There may be other circumstances that make taking more text less objectionable than taking less. So for my purposes at this stage, summary judgment stage, that may make that outcome possible. And in this case, we now know, and if my lords and my lady give permission for its admission, I can rely upon the evidence that the letter was crafted in a way deliberately to make it hard to communicate in part, or at least to do so without risk of being accused of manipulating or misleadingly editing it. That is plainly a material factor in assessing where the balance between the rights lay, particularly where the arguments from the other side and the judge's approach proceeded from the point of view that disseminating more text is more objectionable than less. As I've said, the position is much more nuanced than that. Now that hopefully encapsulates and gives my lords and my lady an overview of our case. Can I just tell you what I propose to do for the rest of my submissions, if I may? First, I want to make sure my lords and my lady have a good overview of what copyright protects, why it does so and how. And at this stage, I'm largely going to keep away from the specifics of the case. I'm hoping to make it as uncontroversial as possible. Secondly, I'm going to very briefly address what the judge did in the copyright side of this case, just so that you have a good roadmap the way the issues were decided and what was live before him, because it's not the easiest thing to follow in terms of ordering. That will be very brief. Third, I will explain what we say the correct approach to the free speech balance issue requires. Fourth, is where I'm going to identify where the judge departed from that. So this is where I aim to identify the judge's errors. Fifth, I'm going to move on to address the fair dealing defence, which we say is significantly different to the freedom of speech defence. From the judge's approach, it's focused on reporting, and so on the defendant, not on Thomas Martha's position and his rights. And indeed, treating the free speech defence as not differing from fair dealing is one of my complaints about the judge's approach. And what I'm going to do as I go through is pick up the relevant places and criticisms of my learned friend, Mr. Mill, as is apparent from his skeleton, and in one case, from the Schillings letter in response to the Ladin Marshall application. So I'm going to aim to tell my lords and my lady our answer to them as we go through. So that's the roadmap. Can I turn to the first topic? Copyright, what it protects, why? As my lords and my lady know, it's a property right. I'm sure you know it protects a very wide range of things. Lawyers call, copyright lawyers call works. And like all intellectual property rights, copyrights exist to encourage particular kinds of activity considered to be a benefit in commerce and in society. Most copyright protection is, and has for many years, in fact, been provided pursuant to international agreements or conventions. And my lords and my lady have probably heard about the Berne Convention, which is the most well-known, dating back to the late 19th century. 
In this country, we actually lump together a wider range of protected subject matter or works under the rubric of copyright than is the case in many countries. So, for example, things like broadcasts and phonograms, and sound recordings, are afforded the protection of a copyright. And here I don't refer to what may be included in them, for example, a musical work, which may have a separate protection. I mean the actual sound recording as a separate thing. And that, the purpose of that protection, those kinds of works, is to encourage and reward investment, which is needed to uh, encourage the creation of such things. And they're dealt with in a completely different international convention called the Rome Convention, and often protected under rights which are not even called copyrights in other countries. The French call them droit voisin, neighbouring rights. But we are concerned with the Berne Convention, uh, right, a literary work, and here the policy of the, lo the law is the protection of intellectual creativity. Intellectual creativity. Those are not words you'll see in the statute. It's still framed in terms of the requirement of originality, which was the old way of describing something similar, but as I should explain, not quite the same. Our, year, our law used to take a somewhat broader approach to what is or may be protected by copyright in an original work and included protecting simply skill and labour. So, for example, laboriously compiling a list of all surveyors practising in London, or barristers in Lincoln's Inn, or bus timetables, or even sitting down and doing calculations, creating log tables, the kind we used to use in school back in the day. All of those, what copyright lawyers used to call sweat of the brow work, but not part of the protective subject matter now. And as the judge actually records, I can take most of this by looking at the judgment. If you have the judgment in tab 11, so, I'm in paras 142 and 143. <clears throat> we now adopt the same approach that had been prevalent on the continent, which is to afford protection only to intellectual creativity, which is different and a bit higher. And that's now what we understand the word original to be referring to. It's one of uh, many effects of harmonisation between European copyright laws over the last 20 or so years. And as the judge records, I'm, I'm now looking at 142. It's common ground, and he identifies the cases uh, of particular significance on that. Info pack in the Court of Justice, as perhaps best explained in the extract from the Advocate General in the Football Data Code, in the passage set out there. It was a move away from the common law tradition to the con continental tradition. And so the key issue for obtaining protection, and importantly also the thing that the law of copyright protects, is intellectual creativity. And of course in literary works we're concerned with literary intellectual creativity. And for many literary works, the change will make no significant difference. Last week's Booker Prize winner, for instance, is no doubt a very significant intellectual creation, and what is actually protected by the copyright is almost certainly the same as it would have been under the old regime. The author will have created a both a very complex and detailed world, storyline and plot, and also made a plethora of detailed and subtle expressive choices in the precise language adopted over the course of a very substantial work. But that's one end of the extreme. Another feature of copyright protection that I hope my lords and my lady are familiar with is the fact that in a single thing or embodiment, there can be aspects of it that are not within the protection of the copyright. It may be something taken from an earlier work or something taken uh, from something that was never a work at all. And let me just illustrate what I'm talking about uh, by giving you an example in the context of a musical work. It may be a musical work may be created by the composer but incorporating aspects from earlier works, perhaps by themselves or in fact written by another. Think of Rachmaninoff's use of the theme from Paganini, that kind of thing. 
And the thing about copyright protection is that it protects that which is original, or in the new parlance, that which is the intellectual creation of the author in that particular work. So Rachmaninoff couldn't have complained about Paganini's theme being taken. And we've given some other well-known examples of this. There's the Warwick and Isinger case and the Labrook case, which we've given you in the authorities bundle. We'll mark them up. They're tab eight and seven. I'm not going to take, to turn them up. But the overall point is that copyright protects intellectual creativity. And to infringe, one must take, i.e. Well, reproduce, a substantial part of that which is the intellectual creativity in the work. Now, as I've explained, the intellectual creativity will often reside in precise choice of language, together with detail or complexities of a created world, character or storyline. And one can infringe at copyrights without taking a single word. If one takes the detail of the created world, characters or plot, it's a question of degree as to how much detail is the right or wrong side of the line. Very general themes or overall plot lines are unlikely to be viewed as a substantial part. But the more detailed taking, the higher the chance you'll be the wrong side. And this is what the judge was referring to when he quoted Judge Learned Hand in paragraph 140. So if we turn back a page, Judge Learned Hand in a famous quote from an American copyright case called Nichols, there is a continuum as to the level of detail one can imagine taking, and where the line is drawn is a difficult issue. But what about less elaborate or more functional or mundane pieces of writing? Well, they obviously can still qualify for copyright, and that copyright will protect the intellectual creativity embodied in the piece of writing. When it comes to pieces where the content are factual, like a biography, the protection, the literary intellectual creativity, will be in the particular form of language, but not, but not the detail of the instance being described. And this is best seen in a couple of paragraphs in Coppinger, directed to who count as authors. And the basic point is if you are contributing something within the copyright's protection, you count as an author, but not if you don't. So the point I can, I'm making can be seen when considering a person who's not doing the actual writing, but provides the detail being written up. I'm afraid that the two passages, paragraphs, didn't find their way into the bundle initially, but hopefully they've been included overnight uh, at least in the electronic version, so that my Lord, the Master of the Rolls, has them electronically. They should be right at the back of Authorities Bundle 2, hopefully in tab 44. I've got it. You've got it? Does my Lord have it? Oh, I don't have it, Tim. And I've got um, kept separately the original Authorities Bundle. If, if my lady doesn't have it, I've got a hard copy I can have handed up. Does my Lord have it? Yes. 44, right at the back. There's one copy with, with the tab as well for my lady. Now, these were, in fact, handed to the judge too. And, in fact, in fact what did make their way into the supplemental bundle was an extract on the transcript where that was done. I'm not going to ask you to turn it up, just, just for, your, for your notice, tab 18, page 230 of the transcript. Um, but I am going to repeat a point that I made to the judge at that point about the submission I'm making, to be clear about this. It is not my submission that factual works have no copyright. The exemplar my friend put forward below was a work of history. To be clear, my submission is not that there's no copyright, it reaches the threshold for copyright to subsist, but that it's a much narrower, less weighty thing. And we see that reflected clearly in the two paragraphs uh, explaining who counts as an author. 
If we look at 430 first, it's dealing with biographies, reminiscences and ghost works. Can we pick it up about six lines in? The author is the person who originated the literary expression. If, as often happens, the subject matter of the account provides detail of incidents as the basis of articles or stories which are written up by another, but does not take part in producing the particular form of language in which the information, i.e. the facts, are conveyed, the subject is not the author of the written work. As the last sentence says, it may be different if his actual language is used, and that's obviously because he's then constructing the particular form of language. Now, the opposite is true, where we have the originator of a plot of a novel, as we three see from the next paragraph, over the page of 431. And it's explained because the protection of copyright in the novel extends, or you can be infringed, by taking its plot without language copying. This paragraph uh, reflects a point I uh, was making earlier, if you take it in some detail, it's likely. That's the continuum from Judge Learned Hand. And so the person who provides that detail, provides the details of the plot, but who may not be the same person as the person who clothed them in words, is one of the authors. Now, I want to be absolutely clear why I've taken my lords and my ladies quickly through this. The broad point is this. As I said earlier, one needs to know what is that which is protected, to even begin to assess the relative weight or importance of the incursion into the claimant's copyright. My point in identifying the fact that material that is not original or part of the intellectual creativity does not count for the assessment of infringement is because it doesn't matter why it's not original in the work relied upon needn't be copied from an earlier work, like my Rachmaninoff example. It may be because it's just pre-existing facts, as we've just seen. Now, of course, the position now is simpler. Unlike the position before the judge, where there was a live question of a multitude of versions of text and possible multi -co multiple copyrights, we're now only concerned with one work, one copyright, and a single author. But where the piece of writing is short and factual, my submission is that single author doesn't get a copyright greater than the one covering the intellectual creativity in the choice, particular choice of language. And so hopefully my lords and my lady can see that we are dealing in this case with something where we have the particular choice of language which may be the subject of the copyright work, but no more. That might be a good now to help me how this helps us. So what, what's, the, what, what's the point of all this? Right, when we get come to the errors, my lady, one of the things that the judge didn't do is assess the extent of the originality or the substance of what's being protected. So it's going to help you when you come to the errors. One of the things the judge, what he, what he did look at was how much of what was there was taken, but he didn't look at how weighty or um, important the right was in the first place. But I thought there were only two grounds of appeal of copyright, which is the freedom of speech and the fair dealing aspects. Sure. And it may be that there was a very minimal infringement, or it may be a very low weight but this is part of how you assess that. It's part of the balance. Okay, I understand that. So you, you, you've got that in the balance. Indeed. But and, I mean, and the judge uh, failed to do that. But, but all you're really saying is this was something that ought to be done at the trial, because it's quite complicated. Sure. That's one of my errors. Uh, uh, absolutely right. But what I want my lords and my lady to understand is that one of the things the judge just did not take into account is the nature of this copyright as being a modest one. No, he took it as a binary issue. It's, a, it's either an infringement or not an infringement, and um, everything else was to be dealt with under the heading of assessment of damage. Well, he, he, that's right. But what, what 
my submission to my lords and my ladies going to be um, that the correct approach to the balance must involve weighing the importance of the particular copyright. Actually, it involves weighing the particular importance of the infringement, which, as I started off explaining to um, my lords and my lady, is a two-part question. I mean, the reason I'm puzzled by all this, Mr. Speck, interesting, though your, if I may say so, your submissions have been, is that um, if you, your side, if, if Associated Newspapers win the privacy appeal, then are very likely they'll at least win ground eight because we'll have said something about an inappropriate balance having been undertaken at stage two. Um, I suspect fair dealing will, will go along with that. If you lose, um, does, this, does this actually, if you lose the privacy appeal, does this actually um, add up to a row of beans? Um, perhaps not. I've actually got my eye on my learned friend saying he wins on copyright even if we lose, if we win the privacy appeal. Well, I'm, I'm sure you have. That, that's um, what I've got my eye on, and that's why I, I put it the way I did to my lords and my lady at the beginning. If my friend is right on the privacy appeal, can copyright make a difference? And that's really the focus of my appeal, of, sorry, of my submissions, to suggest it can't. Well, you say, you say it can't because the balance, the fair dealing, sorry, the freedom of speech balance was probably skewed anyway because he, he looked back at the privacy, privacy uh, balance and the fair dealing one goes along with it even if it's a different test. Indeed, there are some errors that he's made but I, I don't dissent from what my Lord It's not all that complicated. No, it isn't. Really, is it? I mean, it's no. made to sound complicated. But, my Lord, what I don't want to do is to be faced with a submission that he, my learned friend wins on copyright in any event. Well, you, well you've, you've made your first point. Let's move to the second. The second is a very short thing, just setting the scene as to, so that my lords and my, my lady uh, understand uh, what the judge actually did. And I'm not here intending to uh, address the errors, as I've already indicated. I'm going to do that after I tell you what the correct approach should be. Um, at the stage of the application for the judge, there was an issue between the parties as to the creation of the electronic draft. In particular, this went not only to ownership, but actual identification of the specific copyrights. It was a point about the possibility of more than one copyright covering different contributions owned by different parties and complications about Crown copyright. One can just see that if you look at paragraph 159 of the judgment, it's recorded particularly in the last three lines. Well, that's why it's gone. Isn't it? it has gone. I, I, I do, the, the reason I'm showing my lady this is so that you understand the structure of this judgment because the point is now gone, but what you've got are findings that were made in the context of a conclusion where the judge didn't actually even identify the copyright. He was unable to do so. If you go forward to paragraph 169, so page 167, particularly the second sentence, we see the point reflected because the conclusion was the claimant was bound to prove she was the or an owner of the or a copyright. And so he wasn't at that stage actually able to and didn't purport to identify a copyright and assess it and its extent of originality and the weight of that. But he had earlier, despite all that, concluded that we had infringed her copyright. That's Paris 150 to 150. I, mean, I suppose it was reasonable, in the light of what he was looking at at the time, to say this is a letter carefully crafted, which was plain just from reading it, irrespective of anything new we've now been told, um, which had some originality, indeed, um, and some intellectual creativity in the way it was written, irrespective of the facts which it disclosed. Yes. I mean, how much, obviously, as you rightly say, is a matter for later debate. It, it is, but there was a complication. That, my lady's right has gone away now, but there was a very... Was yeah, I understand the complication about the electronic draft and the other authors and so on, but that's all gone. That has gone now, but you, you have to understand that that was live in front of the judge when you understand what he's doing. When Indeed, he, and it made the point more complicated for him. It, 
it, that's why it, it's it, taken it, in two stages. Now, the other big thing that I want my lords and my ladies to just grasp when it comes to dealing with the defences is that he dealt with fair dealing first and then dealt with my attack on free speech second and very, very briefly. Yes. And I'm going to come back and look at the consequences of that in due course. Um, now, topic three, the correct approach uh, to the defence. I've already outlined this, so hopefully I can take it relatively briskly. And before I do so, let me make it absolutely clear, just touching on a point that my lady just raised. Because of the developments after the judge's decision, that issue of multiple copyrights with different owners and different scopes went away. And we now accept there's just one, it's the result of the claimant's work, it meets the threshold for copyright to subsist, and there's been reproduction of a substantial part. And that's why my submissions are focused on the defences. Nothing I submit is contrary to what I've just said. The fact that the threshold for copyright to subsist, subsist has been met there's nothing about the scope or nature of the intellectual creativity protected by it, nor what the result on the balance with Article 10 should be. Because, of course, one never needs to consider Article 10 and its balance if the thresholds hadn't been met. Having identified that, can I say what I, we say the correct approach is, where there's a conflict between fundamental rights it is the approach set out in Ries. There's some suggestion in my friend's skeleton, this is his paragraph 69, that in Ries is perhaps not as important as Ashdown, because the former was concerned with the balance between Article 8 and Article 10, whereas Ashdown concerned copyright. I'm going to come to Ashdown in more detail, but to deal with that particular point at the outset, can I show you in Ries being applied in a case concerning intellectual property? It's the Cartier case at tab 32 of the second authorities bundle. It was a case concerning trademarks and counterfeit goods sold on the internet. And the issue in the case was securing blocking orders, that is orders requiring internet service providers to block particular content on the internet. It was a case that engaged, obviously, the property in the trademarks and the freedom of information right. And if you go to 836 of the bundle, that is, 241 of the report, you've got a marked passage. The judge called this section of his judgment proportionality probably because it overlapped with the overarching requirement under the Enforcement Directive uh, applicable to IP rights uh, for proportionality. But the bit I want to show uh, my lords and my lady specifically is the extract at the foot of the page. There the judge sets out an extract from a judgment of his own in Goldeneye. So which page are we in the bundle? Uh, 836 of the bundle. It should be paragraph 186 of the judgment, which is a long extract, actually. There's just one and a bit lines introducing it, and then it's all an indent. It's right at the bottom of the page. Thank you. Do you see, he says, the approach to considering proportionality I set out in Goldeneye, and then that whole passage is from Goldeneye. And in that extract, you see in the middle of that passage the reference to Lord Stain in Ries, acknowledged as being an Article 8, Article 10 case, saying that approach is also applicable in the Goldeneye case, and that's where the rights are Article 1, First Protocol, that's property rights. In fact, in Goldeneye it was copyright. And if you go over to the top of 837, so that's the next page, you see mention of approval of that passage at the highest level, and then an explanation that in the Cartier case, the judge was concerned with intellectual property rights balanced as against freedom of information and freedom of conduct business. And he's obviously using the EU Charter of Rights numbering there. Uh, but we say it's the same approach uh, in Ries, in my submission, with an intense focus on the specific rights in the case. Does that matter the copy in the passage you've just shown us? If it's um, from Goldeneye, 
Not in my submission, no. I mean, Article 8, my lady's picked up a point which is a, the actual rights in issue there were Article 8 and the property right because it was a Norwich Pharmacal, it was a Norwich Pharmacal application. But that's Goldeneye. Cartier is not such a right. That's why I turned over the page to show you that in Cartier, the conflict included the right to carry on a business, but the, the freedom of information and the trademark right was the right in Cartier that were basically being balanced. So my submission is that the judge is doing the same in both. When you've got an intellectual property right, in Goldeneye, the balance was Article 8. With my lady's right, it was the Norwich Farm Court order, so it's privacy. But in Cartier, it was freedom of information. Still the same balance, in my submission. So it, it, the same balance, and it requires an intense focus on the specific rights in the case. And as my Lord the Master of the Rolls just put to me, if you've heard submissions from a learned friend about Mr. Markle's rights on that, and if my um, I've already said, my learned friend's right about that. The consequences have equal force for this defence, whether the judge took too narrow a view on the free speech rights. As to the copyright itself, or more specifically the infringement of the copyright, which is the countervailing right, the infringement is taking the extracts of what is something which is a factual account of what transpired. So the intellectual creativity is just that which attaches to the claimant's particular choice of the language in respect to the extracts that were taken. That is what's in the balance in the copyright part of the case on the other side. What is the intellectual creativity? How important is the particular choice of the language that the claimant uh, made? Why is that less important than a, a carefully crafted letter? Uh, why is that less important than carefully crafting a page in a novel? I mean, I take your point that one contains facts, well, but why does that matter? It matters for the reason that I've tried to explain a little while ago, where you've got a page in a novel, the protection extends not just to the choice of the language, but the detail of the plot and the storyline that is there. That's why the person that's, that's providing that aspect, the person that provides that aspect counts as an author, because they are providing something within the subject matter. person who is just providing facts doesn't count as an author because the facts, the detail, is not within the protection of the copyright. It's simply the actual choice of language that's protected. Well, we get that. Well, I get that as being something that is um, uh, reduces the, the weight of the property right in this balance when you come to do the balance. So That's all my submission is. There we are. Well, okay. That's all my submission is, that it is less important for the reason I've just explained. You probably want to see why the judge, uh, you say, Certainly. messed it up. Yeah, and we will get to that. I, okay. It's topic four, I think, in the list. All right. Well, we're um, on, this is three, isn't it? So yeah, so we're, we're nearly four. there. The, 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 the other um, point that I've made, already foreshadowed, it, it is that when one is dealing with uh, a right work that's, sorry, I've got to on the seat. When one's dealing with a work which has been drafted in, in, in a way as to make it hard to communicate in part without a risk of being manipulated, without being accused of manipulating it, 
that means that that is a factor in our submission that goes into the balance as to why taking more of the text may be appropriate. And in fact, Mr. Nauf has explained, what I have in mind is the end of his paragraph 8, I'm not going to ask you to turn it up, but it was drafted in that way, so much so that if the letter was made public, the claimant wanted the full narrative as set out in the letter to be understood and shared. Now it's right for me to point out that the claimant accepts she sought to frame it so as to prevent it being manipulated or misleadingly edited. That's her statement at 14A. But she disputes that last sentence from Mr. Nell. I have in mind the end of her paragraph 9. Now that is obviously a conflict with Mr. Nauf, which is a tribal issue. But what we say is it's well arguable that there is a factor that was not apparent to the judge that in striking the balance between free speech and in particular looking at matters that my learned friend's been addressing, how much um, might fairly be taken. The fact that it's been drafted deliberately to make taking less difficult is an important factor that would have been material. Would have been material. And it probably actually explains a peculiarity about the claimant's case <coughs> that's always puzzled me. The claimant specifically complains in her pleading that the publication was more objectionable because some of it was left out. Can I just show you that? It's the pleading, so it's in CB1, tab 20, para, sorry, page 238. Core bundle. Yes, core bundle one, number one, sorry. It's the, it's the particulars of claim right at the back of that. Page 238. Subpara 9, at the foot of the page, Uh, um, I'm in core bundle 1, yes. tab 20, page 238. It's part of the particulars of claim. And I'm, what I'm directing attention to is subparagraph 9 and 10 over the page. The thrust of that being a complaint that publishing the extract with mm. large sections omitted is worse in the sense of more objectionable. And I just draw attention to that because that dovetails in with what we now know about the way it was deliberately drafted. And I do say that the, there may be cases, and this may be one, where taking more is particularly necessary to avoid allegations of misleading me, editing it. Well, you haven't avoided those allegations. Well, your, your Lordship, I, I, as I was saying it, I thought you were going to say I haven't avoided the allegations, but what it shows is that the, the approach of taking more is always more objectionable, is wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to, to be pushing back on this, um, I must suspect, but this is all to do with a balance. Yeah. And it's all to do with an evaluation. Yeah. And an evaluation is preeminently something that is not appropriate for um, summary judgment. So, very interesting, though it is, we need to get to the errors the judge made in giving judgment um, against uh, your clients on the copyright claim. We do. We do. There were two things before I was going to get there. All right. And, Thank you, though. And well, one is Ashdown, which is quite a long topic, and, and I do think that my Lord's... Well, why are we looking at Ashdown? Well, because the judge relied upon it. No, no, that's not the reason. Why are we looking at it? Do you say the judge's reliance on Ashdown was wrong? Yes. At all? N not that you ignore it, but it's a totally different case, and, and you've got to understand what they were deciding in Ashdown. The approach in Ashdown is not the modern approach. Let's deal with Ashdown now. If I may, because it is one of the 
I mean, should we look to see what the judge said about it first? And I say we've got uh, in our minds why we're, what we're, what we're here. Which paragraph is it of the judge? It's the one of the two paragraphs where uh, he deals with uh, the free speech. So it's uh, one five seven. Yeah. Well, we've got one five four first mention. Yeah, you're right, he deals with it earlier, but the real thing is in, in 157 and 158. Okay. It's quite difficult, my lord. That I, yesterday, after I saw um, the way you put um, some points to my learned friend, I did think about whether it's easy to identify the error without having told you what the judge should have done. And it's really quite difficult on this part of the case for me, because the judge's reason on free speech is the last sentence of 158. That is it. He's got two paragraphs where he sets out some background and his conclusion, but his reason is one sentence. Same as fair dealing. Yes. And where do we find the fair dealing? Reason? Fair dealing, well, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to take you through that when I come to his errors, but the nub of his reasons in one, are in 155 and 156 for fair dealing. So the page before. Let me tell you, actually, in the light of what my learned, what my lord's just said, I think I am going to have to come back to Ashdown. But let me tell you what the errors are. I'm going to move over to the errors. Gosh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is, I, know it's, um, I know that creating an architecture is all what advocacy is about, but judges are a little impatient and like to cut to the chase. I understand, I understand. And to find out what we've got to have in our mind as to what you say the judge did wrong. Because if not, I find it really difficult to attach any structure to well, the, the rest of I'm it. Gonna it. Good. I'm going to do it. Excellent. Right. A, a, as, as my Lord sees, we're looking at 157 and 158. Yeah. And I just want to explain what you get from those paragraphs. He's done fair dealing, as you just see. And the first of those paragraphs refers to the public interest offence, section 171 of the Act and the Hyde Park case referring to the ability to stop the process of the court being used for purposes that are contrary to public interest. When we look at Ashdown, you'll realise that that sentence is really puzzling because Ashdown disapproves of that. What, freedom ex of expression will... No, the reference to Hyde Park and the public interest right. is it's puzzling. It's not central to what he's doing, but it is a very puzzling sentence. The judge then goes on to refer to Ashdown and the possibility of freedom of expression prevailing in the middle paragraph and specifically sets out what Ashdown says about it being very rare. That's four lines from the end. Yes. At paragraph 158, he says, this is not such a case. He, in substance, he says, there's no basis on which the court could conclude, if it wasn't fair dealing for news reporting, that copyright would not outweigh the free speech right. He puts it in terms of public interest requiring copyright to be overridden. Hmm. That's his conclusion set out. And his reason, as I've already said, is just one sentence, that last one. And he simply says it's sufficiently explained by what he's already said because the grounds relied upon are not materially different for fair dealing. We go back to Para 155 and 156. We see the nub of that explanation, specifically the end of 155, he identifies that the use was in breach of privacy and he says with one exception irrelevant to any legitimate reporting purpose disproportionate so turning to his errors first is that if my learned friends write about as having an arguable defence to breach of privacy he's relied upon that here as well so this can't stand either 
On both counts. Yeah, exactly, on both counts. He's also relied upon Ashdown in a way that hasn't understood a key difference about Ashdown and what was in play there. And I'm going to have to go to Ashdown to make that point good. But that, just, that tell is us, just tell us what the key difference is. Right. The key difference is, is a point that my Lord, Lord Justice Bean picked up on yesterday. The only argument in Ashdown about the need to include the text was an authenticity argument, basically to prove they'd got it. The only thing the journalists wanted to do was to make, or was to um, report on four factual points, and the only argument we see in Ashdown about why they had to take the text is about adding weight to the report by proving that they'd actually got Paddy Ashdown's minutes. You don't have anybody in the position of Thomas Markle that you do here. And so to make our case like Paddy Ashdown's case, you have to postulate something similar to what my Lord, Lord Justice Bean did in relation to the Prince of Wales debate yesterday, the courier in intercepting it. And, and it was obtained by underhand means in breach of confidence. There's nobody in that kind of position in Ashdown. And the argument, there just wasn't an argument that there was a free speech right uh, to advance or to disseminate the uh, tone and content <laughs> of the document, other than this very narrow one that it needed to be quoted for authenticity. So, so your, your reason for wanting to dwell on Ashdown is the third sentence of paragraph 157, where he says that it's only in a rare case that it will trump. And you say, well, that's a different kind of rare case from the rare case we're dealing with here. I mean, this is obviously a rare case for other reasons. Yeah. Uh, this is not a case of interception. This is not a case of stealing the memorandum. It's nothing like that. Nothing and therefore, like this is not a situation where he should have started from the proposition of a rare case. Or, or, or if it is a rare case, we're actually in it. I, I adopt everything my Lord's just put to me, but I could put it another way and say, even if I'm wrong about that, and in a sense it doesn't matter how rare the cases are, this is such a case where the issue is the, the tone and content, the issue of the free speech right is the tone and content of the letter. It is not. It is not um, a case like Ashdown, where it was a private minute obtained in breach of confidence, and the argument advanced. And I will, I, I will come back and show that to you, my lords and my lady, if, if I may, because it is, it's, it's quite an important plank of my friend's case, I think, Ashdown. And I do want to make sure that you understand why we say. There are two reasons why you say this decision can't stand. One is because he's relied on all the privacy grounds, and you say you're right about the privacy grounds. And two, uh, because he's looking at it as a very rare situation, and Ashdown wasn't directly applicable. First two points. There are more. Of there are more. There are, Mr. At least we've got the first two. Yeah. Well, actually, well, they are the first two, and they're perhaps the most important. Um, the, the, the more. The next point actually is pretty significant as well in my submission. And I'm obviously focusing only on the free speech right here. He's wrong, and it's an error, to lump the free speech defence together with fair dealing for reporting current events. As we've seen when we look at the bits on free, fair dealing, 155 and so forth, the judge is focusing on what he refers to as legitimate reporting. So the position of the defendant. So the third error on the free speech balance is what's missing from the analysis completely is Thomas Markle's free speech right. Completely. And incidentally, the judge is wrong to say the grounds relied upon for free speech and fair dealing are not materially different. Of course it's true that underlying 
the underlying factual narrative, so specific paragraphs referred to earlier in the pleading, when one gets to the pleading of those defences, for instance, as to the position of the claimant and to do with the people article, are largely the same, but the actual grounds differ significantly. Not least in the additional reliance on Thomas Markle's free speech rights. Let me show you that. Um, it's Core Bundle 2, tab 21, page 362. Core bundle 2 it is, it's the first tab right at the front of that second bundle, so it's tab 21, it's page 362, where we're pleading out the defences. Mm -hmm. Paragraph 36 is the free speech par paragraph, and you see at Mar Mr. Markle's right is referred to in the main body of the paragraph. So right at the beginning of 36, and specifically picked out and explained separately in paragraph 36 two, and again, together with the other rights, is identified in 36 three, explaining the rights, why they, in our submission, are particularly weighty. But if you go over to, or you're all over, already over to 37 which is where the reporting for reporting of current events is pleaded, 37. It refers to Mr Markle's dispute with the version of events put forward by the People article. I'm now around the bottom hole punch. Aspects said to be the subject of legitimate news reporting, but there's no reliance on Mr Markle's free speech right in that it's the reporting paragraph. The grounds are just not the same. So that's the third error. The analysis of free speech omits any consideration of Mr. Markle's free speech at all. The fourth is the judge has not taken into account the importance or weight of the copyright. And that's what we put in our skeleton in paragraph 41, we, the way we frame it there is the extent of originality. I could have said the extent of the intellectual creativity being protected. And that's why I was explaining to my lords and my lady, you've got to have a feel for what's protected. Because it's being a short, factual, written communication, in terms of what copyright protection protects, it's relatively modest. And that point is, of course, separate to and in addition to the question of how much of what is protected has been reproduced. And the reason I make that trite observation is it's clear, my only friend Mr Mill doesn't have any answer to that point. The best he can do, this is para 73 of his skeleton, where he goes back to the section of the judgment on fair dealing and picks out a sentence where the judge says a large and important proportion of the work's original literary content has been reproduced. That's a statement about how much of that which is protected has been copied, not how weighty that which is protected is. And just to illustrate the point, um, my point would be as good if the case was one where a letter in its entirety was reproduced and the sentence seized upon by my friend referred to the entirety instead of a proportion. It's simply not meeting the point to say a large and important proportion of its literary content was taken. taken. It begs the question large and important proportion 
of something which is how weighty. And the last point that I have in my note as to errors is, of course, the additional point, the factor that I want to rely upon because of the uh, new evidence about the fact about um, not approaching things on the basis that taking more is necessarily more objectionable. And I've elaborated that to my lords and my lady already. So those are the errors on uh, the free speech um, part of the case. Uh, I do think I ought to, if, if my lords and my lady will permit, take you through Ashdown to just explain why I say that about Ashdown. Yeah. It's in the first authorities bundle, tab 15. As I think you uh, may recall, it's a case that refer that relates to Paddy Ashdown's nine-page minute of a meeting between himself and the Prime Minister, Mr Blair, which was part of his confidential diaries. Uh, they've been kept confidential and were created with a view to later publication. And in fact, Mr Ashdown was beginning to explore that possibility. So there was a commercial interest of the claimant that was damaged by the publication by the Telegraph. But, as I've foreshadowed, one important aspect of the case to note is that there's nobody in the position of Thomas Markle in our case, or anything remotely similar. Nobody who legitimately had the document as an addressee of the communication and wished to make it public, the tone and content. And indeed, you see a point that I made uh, a minute ago about it being obtained in breach of confidence in paragraph 75 so that's on page 302 the document was obtained in breach of confidence so it is very much like the Prince of Wales case debated yesterday and it would require the kind of modification to our facts that my Lord Lord Justice Bean put in relation to the Prince of Wales yesterday the next important thing to note is that the use uh, of the minute that the journalist uh, wanted to write about was Mr Ashdown and Mr Blair's plans for cooperation between their two parties. And the specific points are identified at page 287 of the bundle between B and C. So it's 159 of the report. This is a quote from the judge below, Sir Andrew Morris. And there are four points listed there. You can see in that paragraph, one, two, three, four. And they're quite specific points of information. And this was a case where it's plain that there was no argument that the actual detail of the tone and content was needed. And as I've already said, the reason they were arguing they needed to take it was a very narrow and specific point to lend authority to the account. I'll show you that argument. It's right at the end of the judgment on page 303. So that's 175 of the report. Pick it up at paragraph 79. You see the argument identified point being to convey to readers authenticity of its reports. The next couple of paragraphs sets out the argument, the basic fact being covered had in fact been published before. You'll see a quote from the observer at paragraph 80 at letter F. And you see at the beginning of 81, that was disputed by Mr Blair. And the crux of it is at the bottom of this page, the court concluded it was arguable limited quotation of Mr Ashdown's own work was justified to demonstrate that he had intended sorry, had indeed obtained his own minute and so as to be able to give an authoritative account and over the top of the next page the court concludes 
one or two short extracts with a statement that they'd obtained the minute would suffice. Because that's what they said on this authoritative argument. But that's very different to the case that we're dealing with. Now, I, I, I do also um, say that my lords and my lady should be a bit careful about the way in which these rights were dealt with in this case. I'm not suggesting that you ignore the case at all, but what's particularly uh, notable about this case is it's very early on. It's May 2001. So it's before in Ries and the subsequent cases which go to the balancing of the fundamental rights, which is the Cartier case that we've just seen. And indeed, a key point that was actually being decided and addressed in this appeal, surprising as it may seem to us now, was whether one did anything at all but simply apply the provisions of the Act, and by that I mean the Copyright Act, as the judge had held. I mean, in effect, it was an argument that the Act was totally free, free speech compliant, and so one did no more than just apply the Act. We'll see that in paragraphs 16 to 18 of the judgment. At page 288 of the bundle. The judge below had also held that the preservation of the public interest defence, the common law public interest defence under section 171, was very limited and not a way to get Article 10 rights into the consideration. And that was based upon the Hard Hyde Park residences case. You see that recorded at 21, paragraph 21. And that's why I said earlier on it's puzzling that the judge referred to that because that didn't survive uh, this case. Now the upshot of the appeal is the judge was wrong about both of those conclusions, although he was right about the result of the specific case. And you see right at the top of 291, so that's 163 of the report, the court is focusing on the way to balance the two rights, that's copyright and free speech when they're in conflict. And dropping down the page to just above letter H, we see the distinction between information conveyed by a literary work and the form of use, words used to convey it. And we see that the court says the prime importance of freedom expression, of expression enables a citizen to freely express ideas and convey information and also to do so in a form of words of his or her choice. And I'm now at letter H, but they say it's stretching it to postulate it extends to the freedom to convey ideas and information using the form or words devised by someone else. And that was obviously a key point in this dispute, where the nature of the argument was simply about conveying those four matters that I showed you a little bit earlier. And really, they were just wanting to argue that they could just lift the entirety or large parts of um, Paddy Ashdown's minute. But the court says, right at the foot of the page that we were looking at, there are circumstances where using the words devised by someone else is important. And I come back to it later. We skip on to the foot of page 293. See, the same point is returned to and repeated at paragraph 39. And we see over the top of page 294, so 166 of the report, the court recognising that it's not always the case. And then there's reference to two Strasbourg cases. And paragraph 43, last sentence. On occasions, it is the form, not the content, which is of interest. And here referring to what is of interest is obviously meaning the or a point of the free speech right. And I would add, of course, one could see that in some cases it's both the form and the content. And the conclusion the court reached, this is para 45 on page 295, is there will be circumstances, described here as rare, where the right of free freedom of expression will come into conflict with the protection afforded by the Act. And then the court must apply the Act in a manner that accommodates the right of freedom of expression. 
And that involves looking at closely at the individual facts of the case. Can I just ask you a um, question about how your case on infringement, which is that this is a, effectively a low-level infringement because it's merely a sort of collection of facts, <coughs> albeit rearranged in the course of drafting the letter. How does that tie in with the case you're now making, that it's, it's part of on, on fair dealing? That it's important to put the precise way in which it's put in the letter, oh, as opposed to in, uh, on the Ashdown case, okay, right. which well, is setting out facts. I'm not actually dealing with fair dealing at the moment. I'm dealing with freedom of speech, but I don't freedom think that was speech. central to the point that my lady is putting mm. to me. The point is this. The reason it's important um, in the free speech rights is the reasons that my learned friend has been explaining, that you, one has to show the public what the communication was to answer um, some of the ma matters that have been alleged against uh, Mr. Markle. The, the weight that I'm talking about in terms of it being a low level or lower level copyright work is to do with the literary intellectual creativity. It's to do with how much intellectual creativity is there in the choice of the language. So it's, it's directed to a totally different value. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the judgment turns to the consideration of the public interest defence pres preserved by 171 of the Act. And Hyde Park, and I'm not going to take up time going through that. The upshot was the public interest defence was not as limited as Hyde Park upheld, uh, and that's the conclusion that you see at paragraph 58. Um, so that's the bottom of 298 of the bundle, uh, 170 of the report. And particularly just below letter G, you see the court says now the Human Rights Act is in force, there's the clearest public interest in giving effect to the right of freedom of expression in those rare cases where this right trumps the rights conferred by the 1988 Act. And they say Section 171 allows this. And as we shall see, the way the court actually did it was not to carry out the kind of direct balance which we see in the more modern cases, but came back to the issue in the context of fair dealing. That's fair dealing for reporting current events. Let me show you that. The section on fair dealing starts at the bottom of page 299. You see current events under the heading section 30, right by the bottom hole punch, so between F and G. And the court goes through that issue without regard to the free speech issues over the next three pages. And that takes you to para 78, which is where I took you to before to pick up on what the actual argument was heading the human rights impact, you see from the first sentence of Paragraph 78 that the approach is to ask whether the public interest, that's the free speech argument, impacts the test of fair dealing. And it's here that the court goes through the argument analysis that I've just shown you earlier, which is obviously very different to our case. But it is important that my Lord see the way that was done there, because it's plainly not the way the courts now approach the balance of fundamental rights. Plainly not. I don't mean to suggest that my Lord and my Lady should disregard what's said here, but for example, we've seen one has to balance free speech in intellectual property rights more generally. The Cartier case, where it wasn't a copyright, so no reliance could be had on Section 171 of the Copyright Act or Section 30. Even in copyright cases, fair dealing reporting is obviously not going to be the right vehicle for many defendants. I mean, you can just ask yourself, what happens if Mr. Markle had been added as a defendant to this claim? He wouldn't be relying upon the reporting exception, but he has a free <coughs> speech right that my learned friend has been uh, explaining. So my lords and my lady have to be careful about the approach in seeking to shoehorn the free speech consideration in a copyright case in indirectly via these two specific subsections. But perhaps the bigger point is the point I've already made 
to my lords and my ladies that it's just a case that's nowhere, it's not, not even close to being on all fours, where you've not got somebody in the position of Mr. Markle, where the document has been obtained uh, in an underhand way, and all they wanted to do to justify using Mr. Ashdown's actual language was the authoritative argument. That was all it was. Now, I see the time. I have a very short amount to do on fair dealing. I think you should carry on because we're probably going to have to resume a little bit later. Oh. Two o'clock, so if you run over a bit, that's better. Certainly. When that so let me turn to that. Unless you have any further questions on um, free speech, I was going to turn to fair dealing. Uh, and. Uh, the first point we raise in respect to this is actually power 42 of our skeleton. And that, again, it's the same thing. I know my lords and my lady have got it. The submissions made in respect of the breach of privacy claim uh, are adopted here. And we say, if we get home on that, the fact that the judge relied upon the fact that, in his view, the activity amounted to a breach of privacy was obviously a central plank to his view on fairness. And we've seen the reference to and reliance upon uh, that conclusion at paragraph 155 of the judgment. Can we just have another look at that? Because there are a couple of points that my own friend makes about uh, matters that are said to be in addition Can I just make a point about the reference in the third sentence of 155 to the effect that whilst the provision of the letter to the reporter in the US was not unlawful, the onward provision to the defendant's representatives here, i.e. in the UK, may have been. The reason I'm drawing attention to that is because my learned friend relies upon it. In my submission, that's obviously a reference to the breach of privacy point suggesting that merely providing it in this jurisdiction before publication may have been unlawful. What that sentence is not is a finding of fact as portrayed by my friends in their skeleton. I give my lord and my lady the reference of 75B and certainly not one that can sensibly be said to be unchallenged given the very clear reliance in paragraph 42 of my skeleton to the challenge on the conclusion of breach of privacy. I would also add the challenge to the judge's approach to breach of privacy obviously extends to his conclusion as to the very narrow scope that he concluded any legitimate use of the letter could be made. That analysis, which my lords and my lady are well familiar with now, where he identifies one exception is obviously also the target of our criticism, as you've heard from my learned friend. So it's equally wrong in my submissions to suggest that the second half of that penultimate sentence of paragraph 155 is also a finding of fact, let alone something not challenged. And the reason I'm referring to this is because that is another of the four things that my learned friend lists in his skeleton argument uh, as other factors uh, in paragraph uh, 75 of, of uh, that skeleton. If, if my lords and my lady have it at tab 6 and go to uh, 75, you'll see it's at the top of page 96 of the bundle. It's uh, yeah, tab 6 of the full bundle. What he's trying to do is to say, oh, don't worry too much about uh, overturning the decision on privacy. It was just one factor. And what they've tried to do is to say, look at these other four things. Now, two of them are basically the privacy point for the reasons I've just explained. My friend is then left with just the factor that the letter was unpublished and the judge's explanation of a large and important proportion of the works originally original literary content being reproduced. That latter one being not much more than a finding that a substantial part had been taken, something without which there would be no infringement, 
And so we wouldn't even be considering the fair dealing defence. So there's not very much there. Now, what, the thrust of the claimant's submission seems to be that unless I can challenge absolutely everything mentioned by the judge, I can't challenge his overall conclusion on fairness. And indeed, you see, that is the course of the submission, the course that it takes. We see the well-known passage from Designers Guild referred to at the bottom of the page. And then over to the top of the page, they say there's no error of principle. We see in paragraph 80, the reliance upon his conclusion of breach of privacy is said to be only one factor, and a reference back to 75, uh, where he says there were others. My Lords, my lady, that submission with respect obviously isn't right. The reliance on the conclusion of breach of privacy and his conclusion as to what was legitimate in terms of amount to use is obviously key, and as I've explained, actually went to two of those four factors in paragraph 75 anyway. My submission, if the judge has erred in his privacy analysis and the conclusion on that, it's plain his conclusion as to fairness can't stand. Absolutely plain. Before moving to the next point, I I'm sure it's obvious our submission is that the judge was wrong to conclude these matters summarily, i.e. that my client had no prospect of success at trial. I say that because in the claimant's skeleton, they've seized upon, not the way we express the argument in the skeleton, or in fact the substantive points in the grounds, but there's a sentence in paragraph 17 at the end of the section on fair dealing where we describe the consequence of the errors that we identify without the qualification that the case is arguable. And that's entirely my fault. But to be clear, I can't believe anyone ever thought otherwise. I'm obviously not inviting my lords and my ladies to give my clients summary judgment on the issue of fair dealing. As the claimants themselves point out, we've not cross-applied for that. Our case is that there's a reasonable prospect of success, it's all a triable issue, and that includes on the defence of fair dealing. The second point is just a repetition of the point about the extent of originality that I've already covered on the fair dealing point, because failure to take account of the weight of the copyright is equally an error in fair dealing. And my learned friend's answer is para 81 of their skeleton is the same misconceived answer. The final point I have on fair dealing is slightly longer because it involves looking at proceeding. It will probably take me 10 minutes. Well, we'll come to that as, as um, soon after 2 o'clock as we can return. Very good. Thank you.